This is Dr. Nader Proxima speaking on the treatment of the serratus fractures. Thank you to Dr. Bravo and Dr. Lee for slides. The outline will be, we'll do anatomy, indications, the serratus fracture parameters, fixation options, complications, and conclusions. The bony landmarks of the contours of the serratus are known. There's a scaphoid fossa and a lunate fossa. There's a distal radial ulnar joint and a sigmoid a notch for the ulna to articulate with the radius. And on a PA view, uh, one can think of three columns, a radial column, a middle column, and an ulnar column. On a PA view, one can also see the radial inclination, this relationship of the distal radial ulna joint, whether there's articular congruity, the location of the ulnar styloid, and if there's any fractures, and see the radial styloid. Here we can see the radial length. And on the lateral view, we can look for articular congruity. A 20 degree lateral helps us see into the joint, and we'll look at that later. We can look at the degree of palmar tilt, typically about 11 degrees. We can look at the carpal position and look for dorsal comminution. Here you can see on the x ray above, the pisa form is outlined in pink and the scaphoid is outlined in blue below. To get a true lateral, the pisa form should be between the tubercle of the scaphoid and the capitate, the SPC relationship. On a lateral view, one can also look at the relationship of the lunate and scaphoid, here outlined in blue and pink and purple, and an increase in the angle can indicate an injury to the scapholunate ligament. Any increase greater than 70 degrees is considered abnormal. On the lateral view, we also want to look at the teardrop. Here you can see uh, the X-ray A, normal teardrop. This is described by Medoff. And an increase in the teardrop angle indicates that the volar ulnar corner fracture has occurred and that the carpus may be subluxating palmarly. A decrease in the angle indicates that there's dorsal angulation. On the lateral view we can also see the carpal alignment. Here dotted out in light blue is a line going down the middle of the radius and in yellow is a line going along the volar radial cortex. This volar radial cortical line should bisect the lunate. When there's poor carpal alignment, the lunate will move palm palmarly and away from this volar radial cortical line. This can be one of the main indicators of subluxation, volar lunate escape, and a predictor of poor outcome. When it comes to advanced imaging, a CT scan is more useful than an MRI for acute injuries. We know that MRIs can be helpful for evaluating concomitant ligament injuries, but up to 98% of fractures showed some ligament injury in a study in 1997. And an MRI, additional MRI, was found to be of no benefit in a study performed in 2001. This is, however, useful information to convey to your patients, and I always tell patients that almost 100% of the time they're going to have some ligament injuries, and ligament injuries can be painful longer than bony injuries. Here's an example of a CT scan showing the volar ulnar Barton type fra shear fracture and the comminution on the axial cuts. So back to the lateral view, we have the palmar tilt here demonstrated by the normal 11 degree palmar tilt, drawing a line from the dorsal to the volar rim and a line going down parallel to the volar radial cortex. Disruption of the palmar tilt can lead to secondary midcarpal instability with an adaptive pattern, and disruption of the DRUJ is another good indicator of poor outcomes. So remember to restore the palmar tilt. Another factor on radiographic anatomy is radial shift. This is translation of the distal fragment radially and it should be less than two millimeters. Excessive radial shift can affect the distal radial ulna joint. On the PA radiograph mentioned earlier, the, the 
ulnar inclination uh, or radial inclination, depending on your point of view, of 22 degrees. And this is um, obtained by drawing a line from the radial styloid to the corner of the radius at the DREJ, and then a 90 degree line with a line going down the shaft of the radius. Comparison views can be helpful. Another thing to look for is malrotation, and this can be seen on the, on the PA radiograph probably best with a mismatch of the size of the cortex. So you want to make sure not to miss malrotation versus radial and radial tilt. This was identified in a study at our own institution. So what x-rays should you get? A neutral PA or an 11 degree PA is a good idea. A lateral always. Oblique um, is useful. There's no parameters to look at an oblique, but it can often tell us with a worse look. A 20 degree lateral helps you look into the joint and also very useful postoperatively for looking for hardware penetration. And x-rays of the uninjured side if they're available for a template. There's a spectrum of stability. Stable fractures are, are those that are minimally displaced with minimal comminution, low energy. Impaction of the fracture site rather than distraction and extra, those extra articular or non-displaced articular fractures. Unstable fractures have large displacement, metaphyseal comminution, the mechanisms of high energy, there's a metaphyseal defect and intraarticular displacement. Multiple classification schemes have been proposed. It's good to know all of them. The Malone classification looked at the four constant fragments, the radial styloid, the dorsal ulnar, the volar ulnar, and the shaft fragment and various types have been described. A type um, three are those associated with spike of bone and median nerve injury. The universal classification is a descriptive classification looking at non-articular undisplaced fractures, displaced fractures, and then those articular fractures that are non-displaced versus displaced and those that are irreducible versus reducible. Most studies will present the AO or OTA classification with the typical group A extraarticular, group B partial articular, and group C complete articular fractures. For the distal radius, the group B are the shear fractures, such as a volar barton fracture or radial styloid fracture. Jupiter and Fernandez pr proposed a mechanistic um, way of looking at distal radius fractures, the bending fractures, mostly extraarticular, the shearing fractures, analogous to AO type B. Compression, which uh, can be the C-type fractures with high degree of comminution. Avulsions, a variation of uh, B-type shearing fractures, which involve a carpal dislocation. And the uh, combined high energy injuries. When approaching the distal radius, there are various ways we can go. There are several dorsal approaches available. Uh, and the dorsal approaches are typically named by the interval they go through. So if you go between a first and second compartment, that's the 1-2. If you go between the third and fourth compartments, that's the three, four, the four, five, and five, six, and so forth. These afford different views of different parts of the radius. The most commonly performed is the three, four between the EPL and the EDC tendons. Palmerly, the FCR approach, going right through the FCR sheath or between the FCR and the radial artery. Uh, the, the, going between the FCR and the radial artery is called the Henry approach, and going right through the FCR sheath is the FCR approach. Uh, they're about a millimeter apart. Um, the thing to remember is that once you go through the FCR uh, and approaching the sheath, there is a palmar cutaneous nerve that is in danger and needs to be protected. Palmar approach is typically used when using a volar buttress plate or a volar locking plate. There's another palmar approach, which is the extended carpal tunnel approach. This is done using the, the volar and ulnar approach by going between the flexor tendons, median nerve on one side, pushing them radially, and the ulnar nerve vascular bundle and FCU ulnarly. This gives you an excellent view of the ulnar aspect of the distal radius and may be considered for perilunate fracture dislocations as well as those distal radius fractures that involve the volar ulnar corner. When K-wires are placed, typically they're placed uh, through the radial side or dorsal ulnar side, and the idea there is to try to go between those approaches. So, for example, a good place to put K-wires is between a first and second compartment or between the fourth and fifth compartments rather than through the extensor tendons. Ulnar styloid um, can be fractured. It's very commonly fractured in the serratus fractures. 
and uh, multiple studies have shown that it's unnecessary to fix every ulnar styloid fracture. However, if you have uh, an unstable disarray ulnar joint, you may consider it. But for uh, board purposes, uh, the answer is going to be leave the ulnar styloid alone. Metaphyseal comminution is an important factor to look at. That's seen on the lateral and dorsal comminution that extends more than 50% of the way down um, has a high probability of predicting redisplacement and dorsal tilt. Here's an x-ray demonstrating a high degree of dorsal comminution with dorsal tilt. The carpus, as you see, has translated dorsally. A good initial reduction, however, there's a void there dorsally, this uh, comminuted bone that can be seen on the dorsal side. And so, even though the cast was applied correctly with a good amount of palmar flexion and nicely fit, redisplacement to the original injury occurred. What are some criteria for instability? Can we look at an x-ray and predict who's going to fail? Um, for stable fractures, minimal displacement, less, degree of five, less than 5 degrees of dorsal tilt, and less than 2 millimeters of axial shortening. This was a, uh, some guidelines that were put forth. Here's an example. The fracture was too displaced, and this one was treated with external fixation. It's important when considering the external fixation to distract the to decrease the distraction. Here the x-ray in the bottom left you can see there's quite a bit of distraction in the radiocarpal and midcarpal joints. This leads to stiffness and, and um, finger stiffness and loss of wrist range of motion. LaFontaine and colleagues uh, described some criteria for stability uh, and instability. Those with dorsal angulation greater than 20 degrees are unstable dorsal comminution, intraarticular, associated ulnar fractures, and patients greater than 60 years old. Uh, this was an attempt to do a more scientific look at uh, fractures. A, a uh, regression model was used to come up with a probability, uh, but uh, follow-up studies showed that uh, this was not very predictive. Either. On pre radiographs, uh, a simple thing to look at is greater than 20 degrees of dorsal angulation or greater than 10 millimeters of um, axial shortening. This was uh, my Cooney and colleagues. But what we found in multiple studies has been that the initial radiographs are relatively unpredictable. Uh, in general, we try to do closed treatment of non-displaced or low-demand patients. Critical vigilant follow-up, that means weekly follow-up for the first three weeks of extra-articular but, or anatomically reduced fractures. And generally, operative stabilization of displaced intraarticular what does the AOS tell us? The uh, task force was put together and uh, some recommendations were made. These were updated, uh, but the uh, recommendations are not universally accepted. Uh, here's, here's the party line from the AOS. Greater than 3 millimeters of radial shortening, greater than 10 degrees of dorsal tilt, and more than 2 millimeters of articular step-off. In young people, that, those are indications for surgery. Other uh, mild indications are open fractures, polytrauma, and concomitant carpal fractures. Where does the 2 millimeter come from? This comes from this article from NERC and Jupiter, uh, and what they found was that those patients that had greater than 2 millimeters of incongruity had a higher probability of developing post-traumatic arthritis. Uh, however, this did not necessarily correlate with function. Um, here's a study by uh, Goldfarb and colleagues, and um, Young and Associates, and what they found was step-off greater than 2 millimeters was associated with radiographic evidence of osteoarthritis. Up to 76% of patients had 7-year follow-up and 81% of 15-year follow-up. However, the arthritis was not necessarily painful. There were no functional limitations compared to those that didn't develop arthritis, even at 15-year follow-up. So it seems that post-traumatic arthritis can be well tolerated in the distal radius. What parameters can we look at for um, success? Uh, those patients that end up with loss of the volar tilt and loss of ulnar variance, uh, or increase in their ulnar variance rather. So loss of volar tilt and increase in their ulnar variance uh, can be predicted to have uh, decreased grip strength and uh, less optimal. Carpal malalignment or lack of carpal alignment has also been identified as an important factor of a predictor of poor functional outcome. And this is what we're talking about. You remember the lateral views, uh, and here the blue line is broken, and uh, one can see that the entire carpus is translated 
Palmer leaving. Greater than five millimeters of Palmer translation of the carpus is associated with poor outcomes. What about the elderly? Um, study uh, from our institution, JBJS 2010, showed that uh, there was um, no significant difference between operative and non-operative treatment groups at one year in terms of functional outcomes. But there was better grip strength in the operative group, there were more complications as well. Other studies have shown the same thing. Multiple studies looking at the elderly have shown no statistical differences in DASH scores um, at one year. So here's a typical example, 89-year-old female, this radius fracture, placed in a splint or a cast, goes on to heal with a malunion, but with a good functional outcome. Should we even do a closed reduction? Uh, this study indicates that there is no benefit to a closed reduction in uh, low demand elderly patients. The problem always becomes how do we define elderly? Is it over 65? Is it physiologic age? Functional demand? The handedness? And no, no one can agree on what the def definition is of, of the elderly. Um, if we treat them non operatively, we're basically saying that the patient's functional demands do not require a fully functional wrist that they can put up with some degree of pain, and that they'd be worse off with surgery. How much uh, motion do you need to have function of the wrist? Uh, most activities of daily living, there's a 100-year arc of motion. However, we know that patients with much less than that can function very well. Um, and even after a wrist fusion, there's excellent fu uh, fu function of the wrist as long as it's unilateral. However, lack of, lack of or painful forearm rotation is not well tolerated, and finger stiffness is not well tolerated. If we decide to do surgery, the goal of surgery is to try to restore the anatomy, maintain range of motion, and return the patient to pre-injury and function, and possibly decrease the incidence of post-traumatic arthritis, although we don't really know what that does. Remember that post-traumatic arthritis occurs when there's more than two millimeters of articular step-off. Again, that's radiographic, not functional. When accepting a malunion in an elderly patient, the idea is that uh, if, if the shortening and the ulnar positive variance bothers the patient, we can always do a distal ulnar resection. Uh, we know that the outcomes of distal ulnar resection in the elderly are generally good. There are different procedures that can be done, um, whether you resect the entire distal ulna, partial resection, or a fusion of the distal ulna called the sauve carpangi procedure, where you intentionally create a gap. Here's an example, this radius malunion with significant ulnar positive variance treated with a distal ulnar resection. Complications of a distal ulnar resection or DARA procedure can be unstable distal stump, impingement between a radius and ulna, and the patient has to have an operation anyway. So in summary, who, who should have surgery? Those patients who live independently. We're talking about the elderly here. Life expectancy greater than two years, no medical contraindications, and a fracture that can't be treated by closed means. What about non-union? Non-union is extremely rare. The blood supply to the dysteresis is excellent. And non-unions typically occur only after operative intervention, which is a poorly applied or poorly chosen implant or some other infection or some other cause of a non-union. Malunions are, are common and sometimes need fixing. These can be done with a dorsal opening wedge osteotomy or a volar closing wedge osteotomy or even biplanar correction. Here's an example of opening wedge osteotomy. You can see the malunion with dorsal tilt uh, dorsal translation of the carpus. This was treated with an opening wedge osteotomy, iliac crest bone grafting, and, and a volar lock plate. You can also go dorsal for this. And that's the most common type of malunion and the most common type of fixation. Uh, however, you can go dorsal, you can go palmer, K wires, or even external fixation. And uh, structural or cancellous bone graft have all been described for correction of malunions. Intraarticular malunions can also be treated with intraarticular osteotomies, and they, and they show good results. Um, these are better done earlier rather than later. Um, and here's an example of an intraarticular malunion performed and treated with an osteotomy, elevation of the articular surface, bone grafting of the metaphyseal defect, and, and plating. Here's another example. This was a, a non-union of a dorsal ulnar fragment, uh, which was treated with uh, open induction, internal fixation, and bone grafting. So 
we're going to focus on avoiding some pitfalls in various types of treatment of dysregulated fractures. Let's start with closed treatment. Closed treatment is a frequent source of malpractice claims. Uh, it takes a lot of work, follow up weekly for the first three weeks, attention to detail in cast application and splint application, and you must educate the patient and document your choices. The reduction technique is based on a dorsal periosteal hinge and ligamentotaxis. Um, the wrist can be placed in slight ulnar deviation and slight flexion, and we want to avoid excessive ulnar deviation and excessive flexion, the cotton lauder position. And the palmar plaster should be uh, stopped uh, proximal to the metacarpal heads to allow for full finger motion. The distal plaster can go more dorsally. Here's an example of a minimally displaced, stable, extraarticular fracture treated non-operatively in a cast, and it goes on to heal. Some pitfalls of close treatment can be carpal tunnel syndrome. This can happen after the injury or from a tight, tightly applied cast. Uh, the position of the wrist, if it's placed in excessive flexion or ulnar deviation, and extension contractures of the MP joint with stiff fingers. This typically is from uh, a uh, swollen hand with uh, no motion of the MP joints or from a poorly applied splint or cast that comes distal enough that it impedes full flexion of the MP joints. Uh, and unrecognized late displacement of the fractures. That's why if you're going to treat somebody close, it's important to get x-rays in the first three weeks to uh, identify early redisplacement. Remember our case with the metaphyseal comminution, um, and by, by the time six weeks had passed, the patient had, had redisplaced back to their original injuries. We talked about finger stiffness and the, and the splint coming too distal. Uh, other uh, complications include RSD and skin breakdown from tight casts, and um, these uh, should be avoided. Cast complaints should always be taken seriously and investigated. Here's an example of someone who had a tight dressing on or tight cast on and developed RSD. Um, external fixation we don't see as much anymore, more, but it's important to still know about. Some technical points, an open pin insertion is safer than percutaneous pin uh, placement. There's a radial nerve that can be damaged by the proximal pins or the distal pins. Over distraction, as I showed earlier, should be avoided, and the length of immobilization should be between uh, six to eight weeks. You don't want to take it off too early or leave it on too long. Some fractures are not amenable to external fixation, such as shearing fractures and, and forearm fractures. The technique involves pre-drilling and irrigation to avoid heat. Heat leads to um, bone death, which leads to infection and loose pins. The proximal pins are placed between the ECRL and B to protect the radial nerve. Um, flexion and all the deviation is used to obtain the reduction, and then to maintain the reduction, K-wires can be used here in Kapanji style or drilled through the radial styloid is as shown over here. Once K wires are placed, the tension can be taken off the external fixator, finger range of motion can be tested, uh, and uh, the alignment verified on AP and lateral radiographs. Okay, the external fixator is then wrapped up into the bandage. Um, here's an example fracture displacement with radial shift treated with the external fixator. You notice there's always two K wires. And that's the minimum the, um, number of K-wires that are required. Um, distraction 2 to 1 across the mid midcarpal and carpal joints should be avoided, and the fingers should easily flex down to the distal palmar crease. Here's a case example, 68-year-old um, female, displacement, high degree of comminution, initial close reduction unsuccessful, second close reduction unsuccessful, uh, treated with um, external fixation and K-wire placement. Fracture um, shows good alignment on the lateral view, and on the follow-up post-hardware removal, good alignment is noted. X-fix uh, can't fix things that don't have ligaments attached to them, so it's not good for depressed articular fragments. Pin side infection, we talked about avoiding it with pre-drilling and uh, good skin relaxing incisions. We found the 19% incidence of pin track infections and K-wire infections generally uh, amenable to uh, oral antibiotics and local care. Uh, the external fixator should always be used with K-wires, otherwise there's a gradual and significant loss of alignment. At least two K-wires and, and the apparatus should be left on for about six to eight weeks. It's very useful for severe open fractures, uh, quick stabilization of severe injuries, and uh, cases of replantation or revascularization with large soft tissue injuries. There are variations. There's a non-bridging X-fix. This is typically great for uh, extra-articular fractures. Uh, 
allows wrist motion, it's minimally invasive, but it's uh, indications are limited in that those, those same fractures would probably do well in a, in a cat. Dynamic external fixation, in a word, don't do it. Um, it has a poor track record, and the more displaced the fractures were, the more uh, poor the outcomes. What about external fixation versus volar plate? Uh, uh, about 15, 20 years ago, this was uh, hotly debated, and uh, between 2008 and 2010, multiple papers came out that looked at um, randomized controlled trials, including one that we did here at our institution, um, and basically they all found similar findings. There's an early improvement in range of motion um, with a plate, as expected, uh, but similar functional results at one year. So what about volar plating? Um, why is it so attractive? Well, you have fractures like this in an elderly patient, um, and the volar lock plate allowed us to stabilize them, start early motion. Here's one week post-op, and the patients uh, are much happier. Um, and although the, it never showed a significant advantage over external fixation, it was quickly adopted um, and has now become the dominant form of fixation. Um, the article that started this was by Dr. Orbe, a uh, former resident at Hospital for Diseases. The approach is through the FCR uh, sheath, exposure of the pointer quadratus, elevation of the pointer quadratus, um, mobilizing the proximal radial fragment, uh, then uh, anatomic alignment and placement of a hardware. Um, soon after the advent of volar locked plates, uh, a problem was identified in that some volar ulnar fragments were escaping. There would be an initial good alignment, perfect looking post-operative x-rays, only to have them fall apart in two or three weeks. Design changes were made, all the companies uh, extended the uh, plates on the volar and ulnar side. So here's different companies, the Skeletal Dynamics, Synthes, Stryker, they all made changes to address this problem. And now this has become a recognized issue of the volar ulnar corner. Um, so-called watershed line. Intraoperative pitfalls, uh, adequate exposure, you've got to be able to see what you're doing so that you can repair uh, the fracture properly. Uh, retraction of the median nerve, uh, it's important to, you to make sure that you're always pulling on the FCR rather than on the median nerve. Plate placement um, has to be in the, in the right spot, we'll talk about that a little more, and some specialized views to make sure you have the plate in the correct position. Let's uh, look at the um, approach. The radial septum can be released and then release of the brachioradialis. This is called the extended FCR approach, which then allows you to rotate and pronate the shaft of the radius out of the way. The plate is then uh, applied uh, to the reduced uh, fracture and stabilized. Uh, some x-rays that can help. Uh, this is the uh, 20 degree, uh, uh, 22 degree lateral view, which allows you to look right down the pike of the articular surface. This is the same thing on the PA view. Remember that on the standard PA, the dorsal uh, rim of the radius is more distal. Dorsal rim is more distal. The volar rim is the white line that we see over here with the subchondral bone. And the 11 degree view lets you look right down the pike. Here's an example of what the standard PA looks like on the top left and the 11 degree uh, PA looks like on the top right, and on the bottom, the 22 degree lateral view. Um, another very useful uh, view is this uh, view taken, this is called the 45 degree pronation view, uh, but it's really taken in supination. You can see here the pisiform is palmar, indicating that this was taken in supination, and it lets you look right down the pike of the uh, articular surface, and also look at the radial, uh, dorsal radial area for screw penetration. Another useful intraoperative view is this dorsal tangential view which uh, lets you see the dorsal rim of the radius to make sure that your screws aren't sticking out dorsally. Um, we know that it's only required for the screws to go 75% of the way um, just past the equator. 75% of the way up is, is all that's required. They don't have to engage the dorsal cortex. What about dorsal plating? Dorsal plating gives you a direct view and, uh, and uh, an ability to do a direct articular reduction by making an arthrotomy. Um, and you can use an opening wedge bone graft for nascent malunions. But the problem is extensor dependence. 
So there are different types of dorsal plates. One is a spanning plate. Uh, this is used for severe intraarticular comminution. You can use a 14-hole 3.5 uh, LC plate uh, or uh, specialized pl plates that are made by various companies that are designed for this purpose. Uh, the plate is left on for about three months to allow the fracture to consolidate and then second surgery to remove the plate. Uh, there are less EPL complications if the plate is placed on the index metacarpal rather than the middle finger metacarpal. Now here's an example, high, high degree of comminution associated with a scaphoid fracture. Um, and you can see the scaphoid fracture on the top left. And the fracture um, had uh, a lot of comminution. Here's the dorsal approach um, and application of a spanning plate. plate was left in place for three months. During that time, it's important to do finger and forearm range of motion exercises. And then here's the final range of motion after plate removal. Surprisingly good range of motion after plate removal. Um, here's another example of a, of a dorsal plate, an articular step off. Uh, it, the fracture fragment is dorsal and ulnar. There's no vo involvement of the volar cortex. So it's hard to control this from the volar side. So here you can go dorsal. This is an old fashioned pie plate, which um, was used along the dorsal rim. Um, this plate has fallen out of favor because of extensive tendon problems. But um, here's the same patient with a good range of motion after plate removal. Another application of the dorsal plate is a locking plate. Uh, there are some uh, dorsal locking plates that have been designed by various companies. Um, and they, they can be applied um, dorsally across the entire surface or on the radial and ulnar sides. There's two ways to do this. Basically, you can either go subperiosteal uh, between the third and fourth compartments, elevating the second and the fourth, and transposing the EPL afterwards. Here's the EPL transposed on the left. Another way to do it is to raise two extensor retinacular flaps and use one of the flaps to, as an interposition between the plate and the tendons, and the second flap to prevent bow stringing. Here's what the plate looks like dorsally, and you want to make sure you go quite dorsal, uh, quite distal with it. Remember that the dorsal cortex appears to be more distal on the PA radiograph. Fracture-specific fixation uh, is uh, very useful when you have radial shift or dipunch fragments. Here's an example, a 65-year-old home attendant with uh, a dipunch uh, injury and radial shift treated with fracture-specific uh, fixation uh, devices. There's many on the market, different applications. Um, no specific advantage has been shown between um, fracture specific versus standard volar plating. However, it's really the fracture pattern that dictates where you go uh, and what implants you use when it comes to these kinds of things. Here's another example of, uh, of a, a volar ulnar fragment uh, and you can see it well here on the CT scan and on the follow-up radiographs. So this was treated with a limited fixation um, on the volar ulnar side, which is where the injury was. Another concept is uh, K-wiring. Uh, there's Capanji interfocal wiring, and, and we've already seen um, bicortical wiring through the radius, uh, through the radial styloid. The Capanji technique uses intrafocal pins that are placed in the fracture site and then used as levers. So here's an example of, of one, uh, and the Capanji the, the pin is used to restore the palmar tilt and then stabilize with two um, K-wires placed through the radial styloid. And here's the radiographs and the functional range of motion. Let's talk about complications and how to avoid them. Um, some, some things we can look at. Pronator repair. Is it necessary? We looked at this uh, in 2013 and there was no advantage to repairing the pronator. Um, so we thought, wouldn't it be nice if the pronator could save flexor tendon problems? But it hasn't uh, been shown to be due to um, What about length of immobilization? Well, we know from our experience with external fixators that even six weeks of immobilization did not cause long-term loss of range of motion. And we know with dorsal spanning plates that we can leave them on for three months without significant loss of range of motion. Uh, so this has been studied and there's no advantage to early motion when it comes to the serratus fractures. What about concomitant K-wire fixation? Uh, we looked at our series here at NYU, um, 338 disserratus fractures. There were two deep infections in both cases. It was a combination of a K-wire and plate that got infected with an infected K-wire that led to deep infection. So if you're going to use K-wires, uh, either monitor them carefully and get them out before they get infected, or bury them and come back to get them out. Um, 
Broken plates can lead to rupture uh, flexor tendons or plates that are placed too far distal can lead to, lead to ruptured flexor tendons. And even some perfectly placed plates can lead to late ruptures of flexor tendons. We're seeing flexor tendons now that are rupturing eight or 10 years out. Um, here's uh, this case with the broken plates and screws. Some of the complications, uh, we try to avoid them by following the, uh, the Sung index. Um, you remember the volar radial cortical line here outlined in light blue? Um, and you can draw a line parallel to it that goes right through the volar lip. The hardware should be um, between those two lines. If the hardware sticks out beyond that red line, uh, then there's a higher probability of tendon uh, ruptures. So here you can see the x-ray all the way on the left, plate is placed in a good position, and all the way on the right, this prominence of the plate sticking out palmarly, and the tendon is going to rub right over it. What about on the other extensor side? Uh, uh, either penetration by the drill or penetration by the screw can cause uh, injury to the extensor tendons, and um, we know that the locking screws do not need to be bicortical. They only have to come 75% of the way up. So we want to try to avoid bicortical penetration of the dorsal cortex. Uh, this is a slide from my friend Steve Lee. If you look, um, the, that's what in green is supposed to be an eyeball looking from radial to ulnar. And uh, really, you think about the dorsal surface of the radius as a roof with an apex dorsal V shape. Uh, and not a rectangle, and then you get the idea of where, where these screws can be long. These long screws can be identified on oblique radiographs. So here, if you see the um, x-ray with no rotation, the screws look like they're in length. Here with rotation, we can see that the screw is sticking up. So always get oblique views. Uh, EPL ruptures uh, uh, can also occur from closed treatment of the serratus fractures. Um, and those that are associated with closed treatment are typically from um, an avascular area in the EPL, as well as some comminution around Lister's uh, tubercle. Um, the uh, treatment involves tendon transfer, and uh, typically the EIP to EPL tendon transfer is used. Here you can see the EIP being harvested. The EIP is the ulnar most tendon uh, when compared to the EDC and then it's transferred over uh, to the EPL uh, and results in the excellent uh, function. Please be on the lookout for concomitant carpal injuries. Um, these are typically seen uh, with um, radial styloid type greater arc injury patterns. And um, I always make it a habit that whenever I have a dysradius fracture, uh, after fixation, I stress the carpus. Here's a, a, a axial stress view uh, showing the scaphalunate um, disruption that wasn't so clear on the x-ray on the top left. Uh, this necessitated dorsal approach and evaluation of the scaphalunate interval, which as you can see, the freer is in the scaphalunate interval with a complete tear of the SL ligament, which was treated with direct repair and K-wiring. Postoperatively, we want to start therapy, um, always work on forearm rotation, be on the lookout for carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, stiff fingers may need to Capsular releases and tenolysis if hand therapy is not successful, and uh, sometimes a CT scan can be helpful. Uh, so I always try to have a checklist. You want adequate exposure, uh, good plate placement, the length of the pegs shouldn't be too long, um, avoid drill penetration, check the DRUJ, check the forearm. If you need additional stabilization or period of immobilization, don't be shy to do that, and always check the carpus. Thank you.